did have the honor of commanding the 49th Virginia. At that time, my regiment was part of General Early's brigade, which was part of General Ewell's division. And then we each moved up one step, so General Ewell was corps commander, General Early was division commander, and I was commanding the brigade. So we had a long history together. Now I am... Uh, we fought many battles together, gentlemen. There it is. Many battles. Indeed. And, and of course, the 52nd Virginia was one of the regiments that was in General Early's brigade when I commanded the regiment, and then, of course, when I commanded the brigade. Stay with you, and I gave you the assignment to, uh, with General Johnson to attack Hall Hill on the third day of the uh, Battle of Gettysburg. In, indeed, sir. Indeed. 52nd Virginia was a big part of that. It, it, it was, along with the 31st and my own 49th. No, we can... Go ahead. Ready? Go. I, I said, if I believe this because it's the truth, this is what happened. We came into the town of Gettysburg, now the town of Gettysburg, from the from the west to the east. General Ewell himself had himself very busy with the Corps. Uh, my division has been in, been in combat, <coughs> along with General Rhodes' division, most of the day. The governor here, uh, General Smith, had his, had his uh, brigade out on the York Road watching our flank. General Gordon was then put in reserve, though he had fought all day. Now, I had left me with two brigades. One of my brigades had provost marshal duty, provost duty, so they was tied up. They only gave me one brigade, and when the thought came down to capturing the, the hill, I saw it right away, General Ewell saw it right away. The opportunity to, to take this strategic position was in our hands, but was it in our capability? Could, could we possibly do it? I immediately called up to the Third Corps, General Hill, who had taken ill, and um, to, get, to get a hold of someone in the Third Corps to bring up some help. General Pender uh, immediately uh, came to me and said that he could, he was tied up, could not bring any of his troops to bear immediately, but we'll see what he can do. General Rhodes swung out on the Confederate right and was positioned out there, and he was also asked to, to bring in troops, but he, would, he had fought all day as well. So we stood there, and as we stood there and waiting for... The, 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 we, means, uh, the means to capture the hill, General Yule c comes to me, and by this time, the sun is getting ready to set, and his answer to me was, General Johnson's on his way up, we should wait till we get fresh troops. And that, by that time we had, here, yeah, we done. had been asked by General Lee to give an evaluation of the Second Corps at that point, and we had basically, as he says, only two brigades left from General Early's division to go, and we had two brigades left from General Rhodes. The rest are O'Neill and Iverson are still up. We only have Daniels and Ramser. Yes. Ramser had been held mostly in reserve. He was still far enough forward that he could advance. But with the casualties that we had taken on the first day, we had possibly four to five thousand men available to continue the fight at that point. If that, and General Hayes's, Hayes's brigade was still, still had progress. We had prisoners. We, somebody five thousand prisoners were captured that day. Somebody had to guard the prisoners. My Louisianians were guarding them. We also have in our mind that the report of extra belly of Yankee troops out on our flank. And... You think about it, when you're making a decision whether to advance, you always have to consider whether you will be flanked or if troops are going from the enemy are going to come in your rear. So we're still not quite sure about that. But even given all that whole fact, we were willing to go forward. We're looking for we're, the opportunity We're looking to do for so. an opportunity to go forward. And we recognize the only way to go forward, we can't go straight on. There are 43 pieces of artillery facing the exit of the town, the entrance of the town, really. So we can't attack from the front, it's got to be done from the flanks. Our core, my core, is on one side of the hill, General Hill's core is on the other side. General Hill had already told his troops to put down for the night, including his largest brigade, his largest division, excuse me, in General Anderson. General Anderson was never put into the fight, but he, was available at that he point. Had not, he had, his men were for fresh and not been engaged. And they were, you know, not put forward. They were told to put down for the night. So the only thing we had available to us to continue the fight was maybe 4,000 tired men who had fought all day. Across from us on the hill, what we could see, we still, we, we know now, later in the war, what was there, but 
Initially, what we could see was an entire brigade of Yankee troops fresh. Um, Arlon Smith's brigade were fresh up on the hill. Buford's cavalry has retreated to the hill. Hancock and Howard have rallied their troops on the hill and positioned them behind the wall. And as I said, 43 pieces of artillery. Well, with no support from AP Hill side, given what is on the hill, and only 4,000 tired men, and the threat of possible troops coming into our flank or our rear as we advance, that's when I made the decision not to attack. Now, post-war, we also know that uh, the 12th Corps of the Union was present within 30 minutes of the well, hill. So General any Slocum attack... Was actually on the field. General Slocum was actually on the field. Was, on, was close to the field. So any attack made by us would have been in the middle at the time of about 8,000 more Union troops being reinforced up to the hill. The 12th Corps of the Union Army was the largest corps in the Army of Potomac at the time. And, and to attack Cemetery Hill, we would have had to go through town. You cannot send a battle line through town. We would have had to march through town in columns, down the roads, most of which headed to Cemetery Hill, which means the artillery could have played there. Then, at the edge of town, half a mile from that artillery, would have had to deploy at that time. There was also, General Ewell alluded to the reports of Yankee troops on the east of town. <coughs> Those are reports that came into me that I passed on. We now know, after the war, uh, General Buford, uh, his cavalry had started the fight when he set them up. General Devon's force uh, brigade was actually from the Chambersburg Pike in a big semicircle around town, about four or five miles out of town, to the York Road. When he was ordered to withdraw, what he did, all his troops rolled up, somewhat lo like rolling up a window shade, and ended up on the York Road. They came in on the York Road and actually skirmished at the edge of town with some of our troops. So we now have this report coming in. A fresh Yankee brigade of cavalry is coming in on the York Road. The 11th Corps Williams Division had cut over and they were coming up the Hanover Road and General Williams reports that as he reached Brennan's Hill, which is maybe half a mile out of town on the York Road, he saw Confederate forces on the hill. He deployed his whole fresh division had started to advance, got to the bottom of the hill when he received word that the Union forces north of town had collapsed and he withdrew. All these Confederates on the hill are sending back reports that there is a fresh, a fresh division, I'm sorry, of Union infantry preparing to attack. So these were real threats and uh, General Ewell had been wounded a couple days before, but uh, I was on the line at 2nd uh, Manassas, and you were too, and we saw what happened when the Union forces kept attacking and attacking and disregarded the reports of Confederate forces, in that case General Longstreet's Corps, out on the left flank. We remember that. Is this a similar situation? I had actually been in support of the initial attack. I was ordered to come into town, but receiving these reports, I kept my three regiments out there, Remembering this, I did send word immediately to these gentlemen, and uh, after the war, General Lowley writes that although he did not believe the forces were there, I acted properly in that I received orders, but the orders seemed to conflict with the actual situation. I took appropriate action and immediately notified my immediate commander and his superior, both of whom came out and looked at the uh, uh, situation. So. Uh, he mentioned uh, Douglas Southall Freeman. Douglas Southall Freeman, talking about my reports, he says, and I quote, the panic of reports of an inexperienced brigadier. Well, I had been three, going on three years fighting, and the panic of reports, if you look at the official record, what I told you about Buford, that comes uh, from De Devon, I mean, comes from Devon's report. What I told you about Williams comes from his report, so it's not extra Billy imagining or thinking people out there, the Yankees say, we were there. Pickett made a charge, it didn't work. Yeah, attack the right, attack right. the, uh, the left, attack the center, yeah, it wasn't that way at all. But anyway, 
This has to do with the evening of the second and how close that people aren't aware of how close we were in success that evening. When the order was given to capture, to take over Cemetery Hill, it was left to my brigades. And we, I lined up the uh, uh, Hoax and Hayes brigades, North Carolinians and the, and the Louisianians, put the General Gordon in reserve. I had the Louisianians on my on the right as you attack the hill, and the, and the North Carolinians in the center, and then I was fully on support by General Johnson on my left. When we got there, now the, the, the idea was that when we got to the top of the hill, we were going to be supported by uh, the third part of the Third Corps and General Rhodes's um, and General Rhodes's div uh, division, which didn't take place. But by the time we got to the top of the hill, the uh, the, uh, the, the, the night had fallen, and we were actually had captured. Cemetery Hill, but couldn't hold it because we were afraid to fire upon the attacking Union soldiers in a fear that they were oxy R soldiers. Because we couldn't tell you one from the other. Cannons. We, we captured cannons. Now, after the war, sometime after the war, I was interviewed and talked to a, a, a soldier from Kentucky who uh, uh, lived in Kentucky at the time and, and told me, as General Earl, he said, he said, "You don't all don't realize how close you came." To ending the war that evening. And I said, sir, he said, General Meade's headquarters had fallen in behind our lines, and Meade was in the house, and him and his whole staff just sat there waiting for us to take, but we didn't, we fell back. Now that being said, a lot of people don't realize that General, at Gettysburg, General Meade had three, three headquarters. They think the Leicester's house is General Meade's headquarters when they're in the books, which he was. When the night of the first, or actually the morning of the second, when he uh, when he arrived, his first headquarters was the gatehouse up there at Cemetery Hill. He immediately moved to the uh, house over there, which is referred to as his headquarters, on um, off the of, off of the uh, Tawny Town Road, the Leicester's house. But because of the bombardment on the second and on the third, he retreated. His staff, him and his staff, retreated to across the Baltimore Road, Baltimore Pike at the time to a house that's, which is still there uh, as his secondary headquarters because they couldn't take, they were afraid the bombardment would be overshot and they would, they, some shells would fall into uh, the Leicester house. So that, that afternoon, the second, during, the, during, during Longstreet's attack, he made that particular movement to this house. When we attacked that evening, he didn't have opportunity to get back to the Leicester's house, so he was in this house at that time, unbeknownst to us. Now, we've come out there after the war that I was told that we don't realize exactly how close we were, not only to, to, uh, to, to winning the battle. That if we were captured me and his staff, I do believe a, a bit of a change to the out, outcome of the battle. But then and, and the outcome of that battle would have definitely been a uh, scale. And, and the reason war. we didn't is it reinforces what uh, Extra Billy said earlier about coming through the town is... The way we had it set up was General Early was going to attack the hill, and General Rhodes was supposed to support any um, any, movement, yeah. any movement that was made, any successful movement that was made. As soon as General Early broke through the line, General Rhodes was supposed to follow through and reinforce that part of the line and expand on the breach that we had made. General Rhodes was in the town could not get his division organized coming out through the streets of the town. By the time he lined up in the line of battle, it was too late. The Union had reinforced and closed the gap that was created. If General Rhodes had been able to follow through on the reinforcing part a lot earlier, we would have gone through that, that we would gap. Have, that would take a and, and that is Cemetery Hill on Cox Hill. We came awfully close. Well, Cops Hill could more that. properly be called Cops Hill. There, there's the main hill, a little saddle, a secondary little hill. And on the second, we actually took that secondary hill and the saddle. So we had half a Cops Hill. The plan on the third was that uh, General Johnson's division would catch the rest of the hill. Unfortunately, early on the third, the Yankees. Uh, came in with a preemptive attack against us on this small hill before we could start the main attack. They actually drove it back, and that's when my brigade came in and counterattacked. But Culp's Hill, we had one of those two, two peaks, the lower of the two peaks, so we were in a good position there, and we were planning on attacking on the third, and we would just uh, suffer that preemptive attack, which drew, pushed us off that secondary little peak and 
kind of put our plans in disarray, so we almost had it up there. But of course, uh, uh, again, what you read about in the history books is what happened on the second. We almost got Mount Top. We almost got Cemetery Ridge. On the third, we almost pierced the line. But uh, Cop Copso a lot is going on there. And if I may, one other thing. There were Yankees to the northwest of us. On the third, General, uh, I, I take that back, on the second, General uh, Wade Hampton's Cavalry Brigade had an engagement with uh, General Custer's Yankee Brigade at Hunterstown. Hunterstown is about four miles northwest of, uh, I take that back, northeast of uh, uh, Gettysburg, the Hunterstown Road goes off the York Roads, so even on the second there's Yankee Cavalry Brigade up behind our lines, basically. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was not the clear cut fish hook that ends here. That and that was a, 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 an accidental fate the general's referring to here, that if in fact Stewart, General Stewart, and I don't like to use these words because I don't think he was, but uh, if he wasn't, in fact, so-called late to get to Gettysburg, his General Hampton would not have been in that position to attack that brigade. That brigade had a dead set in their mind to get in our rear. That's where they were heading. And I do believe that they were in our rear early on like they were, that things would have been a lot different as well. You would have to be very brave to that point of foolhardness to take one brigade and attack the rear of the Confederate Army. Uh, George Custer pretty much defines foolhardy uh, bravery and he had only been a brigade commander for, I believe it was five or six days. He had just come up from the rank of captain. He wanted to make his name. Of course, uh, some 13 years later, when he was older and more mature, he's going to plunge right ahead and anyhow. You can imagine what he would have done at the age of 22. So uh, if Hampton's brigade had not just happened to come into that area at the time, the only thing that would have stood between the rear of uh, General Lee's army and uh, uh, this cavalry brigade was my brigade of three small regiments, two of which were on the uh, York Road and only one on the Hunterstown Road. So uh, there, there's a lot taking place around the periphery, periphery of the battlefield that you do not read about in, in the history books. It's a nice clear-cut fish hook and a nice clear-cut line around it, but uh, down, down here on our left, the Union right, there, there was a big no-man's land. The only part you hear about is Spangler Spring, but that whole area there was, was in a state of flux. Yeah.